Our next panelist is uh, Dr. Uh, Akansha Singh. Um, I would like to introduce you uh, to our uh, other panelists and to our uh, modest audience, but uh, still we're very pleased that there is a, an audience beside our panelists. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Akansha Singh uh, is a, a former research scholar at the Center for European Studies at the, mm, sorry for my pronunciation, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. And she has just com successfully completed her PhD thesis titled Minority Rights in the Baltics, a case study of Russian minority, 1991-2015. As we see with this uh, presentation, as well as with the next one, we are going a bit beyond the mm, chronological frame uh, that has been set for our conference, but it's a conscious choice. It's in order to mm, show that, in fact, the 20th century, the so-called short 20th century, uh, casts longer shadows into uh, the uh, beginning of the 21st century, longer than uh, we uh, could assume uh, in the time of uh, euphoria. Uh, in, uh, by the end of 1980s, uh, beginning of 1990. Um, she has been to Baltic State, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania for her PhD field survey. She was awarded a junior research fellowship and a senior research fellowship uh, from uh, UGC um, uh, between 2011 and 2016. And um, her research uh, interests uh, concern foreign policy, human rights, minority rights, multiculturalism, international migration, security, and international politics. Uh, she published in 2018 um, um, paper on the U.S. influence on the Baltic states through NATO and its impact on Russia's security, something that will be uh, also addressed to uh, for sure uh, in our uh, third and uh, last presentation today morning. Um, if you are ready, uh, we can start. You can share your presentation if you have one. Are you able to see it, sir? Yes. Okay, it's great. We see you and the presentation. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Pierre, for accepting my paper. Let me just, uh, because you have given me the opportunity, let me just first uh, express my heart felt gratitude towards you because you have accepted my paper you have given me the opportunity to you know kind of uh, be a part of this highly intellectually stimulating sessions and uh, i've been you know kind of thoroughly enjoying all these uh, two days events i hope you enjoy my lecture as my presentation as well so my uh, presentation is on uh, which you can see very well on the, your screen as well it is on baltic states in the border conflict with russia through the lens of uh, Russian speaking population. And uh, so, since we have had all these discussions uh, since the first day about the historical perspective, maybe my presentation will bring the new uh, era uh, features uh, and which you can kind of relate it with the border conflict. Uh, sorry, so, could, could I just yeah. ask you to, if it's possible to uh, speak uh, loudly enough uh, for okay, okay, our okay. The translators, yes. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Thank you. Am so I, much. am I uh, okay now? Like, should I keep the volume yeah. this level please, or little please increase? Close enough of the micro, and it will be fine, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so, um, why do we have to include the Russian-speaking population when we are talking about border? See, uh, it became important to kind of uh, introduce this particular aspect after the 2014 Ukrainian crisis. Because after Ukrainian crisis, and since you're from Europe, you would have uh, heard in news and news reporter, reports, uh, etc., even in academia, that uh, 
people or the academic uh, academic world was kind of associating this particular phenomena with the board of uh, baltic states as well the next presentation will deal uh, i think they are going to talk about all these nato and uh, militarization and security aspect but i am just taking a small aspect which you know uh, where people sometimes they tend to forget that uh, because all these um, what do you call issues related to borders and all these territorial conflicts they somehow tend to forget about people the people who are getting affected what is the impact over uh, on these migrants or or these uh, minorities who are living there in these countries since a long time it is not something uh, which can be you know kind of missed one should not forget this aspect to include so my focus is uh, on the border conflict and i've had the experience of all these historical perspective also and on, i remember on the first day uh, one professor spoke about all these treaties so uh, somehow this aspect will kind of introduce you to the very phenomena of people how people are being affected how people are being impacted all uh, through this fear and all these border conflicts uh, along with the nato so that the scheme of my presentation is uh, first i'll talk about the introduction then a uh, little bit i will touch upon the historical background briefly then i'll talk about the estonia russia border issue as a case study i have tried to concise it in my two or three slides then uh, latvia russia border issue while lithuania's case is different than other two baltics when we talk baltic states when we talk about the russian speaking population the russian speaking people who have been living here since generation all together then uh, we will uh, talk i will try to uh, present their perspective and then uh, i will conclude my presentation so <clears throat> my when you have uh, briefly mentioned what i'm going to deal with my presentation and how am i going to you know kind of uh, continue so uh introduction let me just adjust my screen first i don't know how to do it i'm so sorry maybe i can minimize it yes so uh when uh, is it okay is it okay yes you yeah, my screen is visible right yes you can yes, see yes, the introduction yeah, yeah yeah okay okay uh so when you talk about the baltic states and uh when we you know kind of and since i'm in the third perspective or maybe because i am not a part of europe or russia so for me for a third person baltic states they share this unique common history since a very long time you cannot say that uh, these three countries are very different though they are uh, and i found out once when uh, when i visited these countries that they are very much different also but estonia latvia lithuania if you see their strategic uh, their position their uh, location their history uh, etc has been it is kind of similar all the these three countries they share the same past as well before getting independence in 1991 these three countries were occupied by the foreign powers such as germany and soviet union and soviet union occupation however this word occupation quote and quote if you talk about occupation has been you know uh, uh, it has attracted uh, criticisms from so uh, russia because uh, according to them it was not the occupation but soviet union uh rule over uh, these baltic countries it has gained a lot of significance because of its contagious nature see in normal day to day or in a normal phenomena when we talk about the colonialism or imperialism we do not associate ourselves uh, with something good it is not something country is uh, like happy or uh, projecting a very happy flowery picture occupation or these uh, foreign rules it is being associated with contentious uh, or uh, very problematic uh, nature itself so these uh, these countries when they, they were occupied by the foreign rule or by the soviet union it was something they wanted to you know kind of move away from the past after getting independence in 1991 they were facing many issues and the 
important issue was related to the territory. territory territorial delimitation of the Baltic states border is one among the many issues which can be uh, which, which has been a so, uh, permanent source of a uh, point of irritation, which has you know kind of increased the tensions between Baltic states, be it Estonia, Latvia, or Lithuania, or for that matter, uh, with Russia. And Russia, because you see these three countries, geo uh, strategically also, if you can place them, they are the buffer zone between East and West. East experience, they've already had it. It is like the colonial uh, rule or the occupation. They've had the bad experience. So once after uh, they got the independence, their whole sole motto was to just to do away from the uh, Russian past or the Soviet Union past. And, you know, uh, they started moving towards West. They're, and because, uh, you know, you would have uh, studied or you would have heard about the realist thought also. Because in realist um, approach, a country's... Uh, motto is to survive in this highly competitive era when uh, there's this continuous state of war is happening there are many issues which are arising so countries uh, their survival is kind of at stake and to survive that uh, theorists have kind of introduced these all these collective methods when you come together and you kind of uh, uh, stand together and you uh, you form these organizations so that you can kind of uh, uh, you can so, uh, you can uh, counter these uh, problems. So the question of uh, national boundaries during this time, it became more important to deal with other series of national problems with uh, what, what these Baltic states were facing because of the membership criteria of European Union, uh, which we call as Copenhagen criteria. It is a precondition to fulfill. If you want to become a member of uh, European Union, if you want to become a part of European Union, you will have to uh, fulfill all these demands. You will have to have this uh, uh, democratic form of government. You need to address your human rights. You need to have this formal uh, forming a stable economy also. So all these tasks were kind of introduced once after uh, they got independence and this nation building process, which was started after getting independence, their whole sort of focus it started on forming all these, uh, fulfilling all these conditions, and these conditions was uh, kind of uh, important to deal with because they wanted to uh, become a part of European Union. So addressing this huge Russian uh, speaking population of Baltic states was also one of the preconditions you can say which they felt that it is necessary for them to you know kind of tackle with. And uh, actually, uh, if you uh, see it properly also, that uh, because these uh, countries, they just got independence after uh, years of, uh, you know, occupation. So they, though they wanted to, you know, uh, have this uh, national assertion, national identity was, you know, their uh, prime focus, but they had to accommodate all these Russian speaking people also because they were, in the large numbers and these people once they were the majority of this area they were not uh, suddenly uh, they were not something one can you know kind of ignore them so addressing their uh, huge russian population also it became kind of necessary and then there was another important uh, uh, task was to setting up a formal and ratified solution for the border issues with neighboring countries with russia especially because it was again mentioned in uh, European Charter that one should not a country if uh, a member state of the European Union uh, should not have a uh, disputed territorial conflict going on. So they were it was kind of necessary for the Baltic states as well as Russia to you know deal with the uh, this uh, particular territory territorial uh, territorial disputed territorial uh, claims because uh, these countries wanted to become a member state of uh, European Union. So this, uh, how, how this Russian Crimea crisis, which was again, uh, it was associated with this ethnic Russian population who was, uh, who were living in uh, Ukraine. And uh, it was on the pretext that this was the will of uh, ethnic Russian population that uh, Russia kind of annexed uh, uh, Ukraine, Crimea, uh, Ukraine's uh, Crimea part because first they uh, kind of um, they projected that it was the will of people and then the military uh, occupation uh, or military, what do you call, 
uh, strike was kind of introduced it was initiated so ultimately uh, because uh, it was something very threatening for this former soviet uh, union countries because somehow russia has been using all uh, these countries on the pretext of ethnic russian population so that's why the border issue or border talks also which you will know in my uh, uh, presentation that in border talks also russia has been using the question of russian speaking population especially the lady to latvia so after this event after the crimea crisis 2014 academia as well as non academia world started drawing parallels between ukraine and baltic states because both the countries have this large uh, what we call russian speaking population it is not that only russians are living there are people from belarus and other uh, eastern european countries who speak the same language and which has been uh, used by uh, current day russia as the pretext as their um, Uh, what they call background uh, on the emotional as well as the practical side that uh, the, they are you know kind of thinking about these uh, Russians, Russian speaking people. So somehow it gave the spotlight to the ethnic Russian population giving in the Baltic, living in the Baltic states, and hence was the fear of meeting the same fate as Ukraine started. This is how they you know kind of started associating it. So therefore, it would be interesting to study the borderland issue through the lens of Russian-speaking people, whether they have had any impact over border issues shared by Baltic states and Russian Federation. This is how you know somehow you can connect this uh, uh, what do you call uh, Russian uh, diaspora, Russian-speaking people, people with the uh, with the uh, border issues. So when you talk about historical background, when one uh, if you see that uh, this whole idea of uh, border or nationalism or national identity, it was it started in twentieth century and it came up as a huge important aspect to touch upon. Why? Because during this time there were many countries, and especially uh, this integration of USSR happened because there were many countries who got independence. If it was started by Baltic states itself, so people or the these countries were becoming more and more aware of their national identity. Ideology of nationalism was revitalized. The border became relevant as a result of political and social ramification. The state border. If you see, if you take this uh, whole concept of um, the state borders it was not like theoretically speaking the state border it doesn't not only represent the division between state uh, and it also acts as a foundational element upon which the state defines the security and their relation with other states border can act as a thermometer basically it can you know weigh the degree of tensions between the states which will ultimately help the develop, help, help in developing and assessing the significance of particular security policy that defines the relationship between them so borders were, they became uh, somehow this uh, important phenomena or important aspect to touch this uh, because during this time in 20th century the ideology was national uh, the ideology of nationalism was revitalizing it was taking a new form people were the countries were uh, you know kind of getting aware of more aware of national identity and they were getting successful also it was like they were creating because new newly independent nations they came uh, they came and they uh, they they came in you know kind of physical form they kind of started existing so according to wilson and donner donner borders are the political membranes through which people goods people goods wealth information must pass in order to be deemed an acceptable or an acceptable by the state it is something which is uh, being decided by the border in pierre has no uh, views where he you know kind of talks about the territories there it what are territories territories that are torn between union and separation between diversity and homogeneity between centrifugal and centripetal forces are all impossible to carry to their ultimate consequences hence the dialectic of the problems of minorities frontiers and migrations that is why these problems are actually coming up and you know this particular phenomena was kind of uh, dominating uh, since the end of world war uh, it was kind of this pattern was dominating the territorial development of the former soviet union countries so the post soviet record on territorial dispute if you see it is Uh, actually very uh, it is humongous it is something very big it is like uh, they had these territorial dis 
views, especially uh, in the because Soviet Union time they shared these boundaries with the other countries. So now present Russia, okay, the, the, because Russia has got the uh, major what you call part of uh, or the power of Soviet Union. So these uh, it's, the, uh, the, these territorial conflicts which were once a part of Soviet Union now has become current days Russia's and there are about one there were about 170 ethno uh, territorial disputes in former Soviet Union so and still there are many territorial conflicts which uh, with Russia is still unresolved and Estonia Latvia border conflict it somehow falls under the same category now what happened with this uh, uh, Estonia Latvia uh, con uh, conflict or uh, their situation, and why I'm not including Lithuania. This uh, Lithuania's case I will discuss later in my uh, presentation. But Estonia and Latvia, because they have this, uh, they're, they're somehow they followed the same trajectory. Estonia and Latvia, both the countries, they pleaded their territorial cases under the mechanisms of international law and they demanded that their borders. From the interwar period should be restored and get recognition from international community. However, Russia uh, and uh, Lithuania adopted a different approach to deal with the territorial issues. It was dealt differently even from Russia's perspective also. You can see here in the map that uh, demarcation line shows the territorial delimitation, uh, uh, territorial limitation between the Baltic states and Russia. Lithuania does not share uh, uh, Russia's border directly from the east side, but it has this um, direct connection with the Kaliningrad region, which was military transit, and it was passing through Lithuania. So their approach, Estonia and Latvia, they share this uh, huge territory with Russia. The border you can see in the map itself, it is like uh, shared by Russia and uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Russia has been, you know, kind of, and there have been. Uh, border talks related to the territories, related to the uh, disputed land which they share. Russia and, uh, sorry, Latvia and Estonia has been uh, kind of following the same trajectory. They both the countries, they had signed these treaties which was discussed on the first day also, the uh, Tartu Peace Treaty and uh, Riga Treaty. They wanted that Russia should recognize the border according to the uh, treaty which was signed before, uh, which was signed in 1920 before independence. But Russia has been indicating a lack of desire uh, to, you know, kind of um, improve the bilateral relations or have the uh, agreements related to land. Though they have signed the agreements, but ratification of these agreements has been, you know, kind of uh, put on hold and somehow they've done it also on uh, over a uh, period of time, but it was kind of slow. They have, you know, showed their resistance. Russia has been beat um, political region or their uh, economic reasons, but somehow there has been lack of desire uh, on the part of Russia. Now, if you talk about uh, Estonia and Russia border dispute, before that, I will just uh, some uh, I will just give the historical or maybe Russia's perspective uh, on the uh, border dispute. When you talk about uh, Russia's lack of desire, you see Russia has been postponing the ratification of these agreements, stating the reason of some cons. cons contested issues such as the uh, alleged uh, discrimination itself, it is something which is Russians projecting. It is not the people or the government of Baltic states are, you know, kind of, uh, they are having these issues. It is not something which is coming from the Baltic states part. It is something which is Russia is actually accusing or this alleged discrimination against the large uh, Russian speaking population residing in the Baltic states has been, you know, uh, Quoted by Russia as one of the important uh, uh, important reason for holding back these border talks. It has been accusing uh, these countries for uh, this discrimination discriminating against uh, Russian speaking population and Russian Federation. On the other hand, they are you know kind of refuting these claims. But they are 
saying that uh, people are suffering from discrimination uh, on the language issue, citizenship issue, and uh, these issues are still unresolved. These countries, especially Latvia, have to kind of uh, solve these issues first so that we can uh, assume these uh, resume these border talks. And this has been leaving behind the existence of any formal or ratified solution uh, solution to the question of boundaries. Uh, so you see russia is something russia's perspective is different what baltic states are projecting and also this discrimination or the russian uh, speaking population russia is bringing this question they are calling them the com compatriots com compatriots and uh, they want them to be you know kind of though they have introduced uh, policies of visa free travel etc and you know these compatriots compatriots they can come and visit their place they can live their place and they have been having these uh, very easy policies for them but all these things have been used by russian federation it is that that is why the political theorist or the academy award has been kind of including this particular picture uh, because it is being introduced by the russian federation so when you talk about historically uh, about the Estonia and Russia border issue, uh, it is uh, this border dispute. It uh, started like it, it revolves around this eastern part of uh, Estonia, and it started with the independence of Estonia in 19, 1920 with the Tartu Peace Treaty, where uh, this treaty was signed by Estonia and Russian Soviet Federative Socialist uh, Republic, which is Russian SFSR. And uh, th through this treaty, they recognized the border of Estonia and gave the recognition of self-government. Uh, this treaty has been regarded as uh, the birth certificate of uh, Republic of Estonia because it was the first de jure, excuse me, de jure recognition of the state. It, something which uh, Estonia, uh, which Russia recognized these countries as legitimate uh, free countries. It was something uh, that uh, it was decided upon that uh, the, uh, Russia will not have a, ha, Russia will not have any control over this particular country. But uh, again, in the reoccupation time, the re reoccupation when reoccupation of Soviet Union happened in two, uh, 1940s, again the they started having this interference and major area of concerns concern of uh, uh, Estonian territory which revolves around the area of Eastern Estonia mainly and please excuse my uh, pronunciation Ivan Gorod uh, which was Yalin on the eastern bank of Narva river and Petrit Street which I'm not I'm sure I'm not able to pronounce it properly which is the south of uh, Lake of Peepers. So this, if you talk about the historical background behind it, that during the rule of Stalin, Soviet Union considered the border between Estonia and Russia as an administrative line, quote unquote administrative line. It was uh, this administrative line that Russia adjusted by assigning more than 50% of uh, this uh, Pechori area to the territory of Oblast in 1944. They somehow, you know, kind of as, uh, assigned this 50% of this uh, area's territory to the other part of uh, Soviet Union. And the area east of Narva is like the buffer zone between these two countries. And the main feature of this area is that it has a large number of Russian speaking people. Narva, if you see, I happen to visit this place during my field work. Uh, uh, time also that these this uh, particular place is um, basically large Russian speaking population live there. So this event, which was you know kind of forceful transfer of this uh, territory, it was uh, it made Estonia lost a considerable size of uh, territory. It was like uh, Estonia lost uh, so much of ter territory. Fifty percent is like huge amount of this particular place and uh, it was uh, it was done by uh, soviet union after reoccupation so this you see the though they have recognized their self governance and uh, independence etc but once they came into power and they started ruling the soviet union started ruling over estonia again they somehow uh, started uh, uh, correcting or reassigning or uh, 
you know uh, adjust thing all these border or territory lines okay so uh, the treaty which this uh, through tartu treaty russia promised quote and quote forever and for good uh, they recognize this Eto uh, estonian uh, territorial uh, integrity and border but shortly after the reoccupation soviet union started again transferring the estonian territory and making this border adjustment in this whole the transfer of territory estonia lost almost five percent of its pre-war territory which contained six percent of to uh, its total population Rus again russia has been refuting russia's response to all these claims uh, of transferring the territory and bordering a border adjustment has been related to Russian inhabitants living in these disputed areas and such circumstances took place as a result of Soviet resettlement. This resettlement was happening uh, after the uh, key occupation and another reason for Russia's position on uh, this border issue is that there are a large number of uh, uh, ethno-territorial disputes and activities informal soviet uh, areas in which pretext uh, present russia is kind of involved in majority so if they uh, start uh, entertaining all these territorial claims uh, by these uh, former soviet countries they fear russian part or russian perspective is that they might have to you know kind of uh, adjust and uh, the large part of its territory why because First of all, its territory is not recognized as its national border right now under the international law or international treaty. And also, Russia, if Russia adjusts to all these claims, it might attract the backfire in other regions as well. So that's why being the regional hegemon, uh, Russia is trying to, you know, put in the uh, good picture or maybe they're not entertaining all these territorial claims. Russia when uh, the first uh, formal border dispute which was articulated in 1992 when Russia issued a statement directing towards Russia to uh, uh, withdraw border security forces back to boundary uh, agreed upon in the Tartu uh, peace treaty, Russia reputed these claims of Estonia and called this, uh, these territorial uh, claims unjustified and Russia gave a very strong response to all these territorial claims uh, of Estonia by uh, you know for being uh, unjustified and they have they also threatened to put uh, all these economic sanctions uh, uh, but you know although they you know they, they kind of gave this strong response but they were they kind of opened this door for border or uh, territorial claims it was something you know very uh, which people did not actually expect, especially in politics as well as in the academia world, that though they were they refuted these claims by being uh, unjustified, etc., but they were ready to have these bilateral talks. So these bilateral uh, talks or bilateral meetings, and uh, they have been, ha you know, they have started happening after 1993, and uh, they have been having all these talks, but they haven't reached any full conclusion or uh, fruitful or concrete uh, uh, concrete solution to these border talks. And if you see uh, that uh, Russia's response, though it is very strong response, etc., but they since the door was open for negotiations for these border talks. They have, uh, you know, they have at least they they started meeting and they, they used to have these bilateral talks. The latest version of these border treaty between Estonia and Russian Federation was, it happened in uh, 2014. It was signed by Foreign Minister Ulmas Pais and Sergei Lavrov in uh, Lavrov in February 2014, and it was uh, different uh, from the previous draft of uh, border treaty, but. As it affirmed that Estonia has no territorial claims, they signed this treaty, but again the fate of this treaty was kind of postponed because uh, Ukraine even took place and somehow they didn't, you know, kind of, uh, they couldn't go ahead with it. For this, this treaty, although they met in 2019 in Moscow, but President Kirsty and uh, uh, Putin, they did not find any place of discussion, uh, uh, discussion about this territorial claim 
talks or border talks somehow it is uh, something which has not been you know kind of very fruitful they have been signing these agreements but the result is same it is not very concrete uh, solution they have come up with now coming to the latvia russia border issue the territory is sorry dispute, uh, uh, i can't uh, uh, can yes. you hear me yeah 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 i can hear you sir uh, sorry uh, if you could consider uh, ending your your presentation with yeah, yeah, yeah. confusing words yeah, yeah. so that we can open the floor for discussion we will be able to to uh, complete what you're saying thanks to questions i i'm sure you can add something during Sorry. the comment section okay i'll just conclude it if, if it's possible in a couple of minutes just to to yeah, yeah, add yeah. some conclusion words thank you so much yes yes yes, yes, yes. So Latvia-Russia border uh, dispute. It uh, somehow it was uh, this uh, dispute was it revolves around the territory of northeastern Abrinne district, uh, formerly known as Yuan Gale. You would have uh, known about this area. During this uh, uh, border, what do you call issue? They basically kind of uh, incorporated not only the city of Abrinne but six rural district in the same area, which uh, you can read in the from this slide. So the uh, Latvia Russia border issue it did not actually get the same level of significance like Estonian uh, border issue. The reasons were again, uh, you know, political reasons were kind of uh, started initiated to pro progress the negotiation, and uh, it was something Russia openly resisted. And during the uh, Latvia, uh, what do you call? Latvia border talks, etc. Russia openly used the question of uh, Russian-speaking population, and after having rounds of talks between the concerned party and in uh, concerned party between Russia and Latvia in 2007, they withdrew its claim. Uh, Latvia when uh, Latvia withdrew its claim over the disputed territory. The agreement was signed, and this important this event was welcomed by EU, and EU kind of supported this. Uh, agreement because uh, somehow it opened the door between Latvia and Russia. The, uh, why Lithuania's uh, status is different, I will just conclude by saying that, that Lithuania, so Lithuania's uh, territorial claims were kind of accommodated by Russian Federation into 1997 itself and people and especially the uh, intelligentsia have kind of uh, said that since Lithuania doesn't feel threatened from this Russian-speaking population, they have issues with Polish minority. It is not something related to Russian people, Russian-speaking population. So the, Lithuania's demographic situation, which is different from Estonia and Latvia, they have, uh, and since they do not have anything to get scared of from uh, Russian part, so they, they have uh, kind of entertained or they have developed these uh, agreements peacefully and they do not have any unresolved issue uh, with border or minorities so it kind of created favorable conditions for the development of better bilateral relations for regional and national level. When you talk about Russian speaking population just sir, give me five minutes please so border dispute uh, between uh, uh, Baltic states and Russia when you talk about the Russian speaking people, it is basically these people, their response to all these association is that, that we do not want to, you know, we are not, though we have this cultural association with the Baltics, with the Russian Federation, but we do not have any political interest with the Russian Federation. We, it is just that we are uh, attached to this particular country uh, because of the culture and culture you it is not something which can be snatched away in few seconds or few months it is something which is imbibed in your personality so they associated themselves uh, with russia more culturally than uh, politically and it is their will to stay back in these baltic countries rather than moving to russian federation and it is something uh, which has been you know they, they feel and especially because now they've been living their few generation that uh, they feel their homeland is baltic states rather than uh, uh, rather than uh, the russian federation they associate themselves with russia uh, with, with the baltics more than russia and I would like to conclude my uh, presentation by saying that though Russia and Baltics have been having this uh, uh, pertinent uh, 
differences uh, pertaining to territory and other uh, issues but they should keep the door open for dialogue for, for cross border cooperation there should be more confidence building measures between these neighboring states for peaceful coexistence russia is not going to lose the interest because it it gives the window to the west and for west also it is important these three countries they hold this geo strategic their geo strategic strategic location is very much to oh, it, it is very much important so with these dialogues and uh, what do you call uh, uh, confidence major building processes they uh, we can reach the peaceful coexistence which is not something utopian it is very much uh, what do you call uh, achievable thank you so much i hope you understood or you liked my presentation thank you thank you so much and and, and thank you for having been able to uh come to a, a conclusion maybe a bit uh quicker than you would have planned in fact it's a very uh difficult subject you had uh, to uh, yes. present and three countries so of course it's not that easy to to sum it up in half an hour but it was uh, really uh, good i thank you very much and i open the discussion uh i uh, just have a look right now first if we have some uh questions or comments from our panelists or maybe uh in the uh, chat window uh, mr uh, dr ragozin and then uh, professor busman uh, this is the uh yeah it's 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 the way it 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 it, it was uh, uh shown on my screen first dr uh, ragozin yeah, uh, Akansha, thank you very much for your presentation. Also touching upon the topic, which is uh, uh, quite painful for uh, quite painful for all its participants. Uh, oh, I have some small comments uh, on your on the on your topic. Uh, actually, we actually there is a methodological. Uh, some kind, of, some kind of methodological trap because um, if we speak on the, um, if because in Russian official discourse and so in political studies and historical works, you can often face that uh, uh, these uh, three countries can be called as the as the ethnocracies, so uh, political systems with quite obvious uh, prevailing of the certain ethnic group. Uh, prov uh, pushing their uh, political agenda forwards. As uh, 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 as for the occupation concept, it is uh, predominantly the official Baltic historiography on the issue. Uh, they use it, and of course, it provokes tensions for both academic uh, academic society. And I'm not able to hear you. Uh, oh, now you can hear me. Okay, I, I will repeat my um, yes. last part because there was some technical gap. Uh, the occupation concept is the official one for Baltic states. Uh, so, um, uh, of course, causing tensions with Russia, both with, academics, uh, with the academia and with uh, Russia as uh, the state in general. Uh, so, I, so, in my just in my possible in my mind it could be maybe it could be it could be better to consider the post colonial paradigm here uh because um, actually there is um, there is a, even an opinion that the occupation uh, means that the resources of the territory are taken to by the by the occupying side as for uh, colonial parody, colonial or post-colonial, we speak predominantly on the investments towards the region. So my question is, uh, uh, such kind of post-colonial attitude could be possible to uh, to work with this kind of uh, study, uh, and of course, could it be possible to? Uh, use this approach to the Russian minority in all three republics, or could it be possible only uh, 
for Estonia and Latvia. Thank you. We cannot hear. Can, yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, we can, can hear you now. Can you repeat your the uh, your question part? Uh, you said uh, about post-colonial. Uh, you yes. did you mean uh, like uh, this occupation of Soviet Union? Of course. You are relating it uh, with post-colonial phenomena. You are telling whether these uh, Baltic states whether they are you know kind of uh, it, it, is it. Where, present right now also or can we can they deal with it what is your question sir uh, my question is um, is it possible to use the co uh, colonial or post colonial paradigm uh, if we speak on the uh, russian uh, on the russian uh, minorities in estonia and latvia or um, uh, and of course to deal with this uh, with this population as them um, one of the remains of the colonial regime or some kind of um, subject to memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, uh, thank you for your interesting question and I hope I'm able to answer it properly. But this colonial past, it, it is something which cannot just go away easily. It is very much, uh, you know, kind of important to deal with this, uh, these Baltic states, especially in the case of Latvia, if you see, it is somehow affecting it even in the present day. It is not something which this post-colonial paradigm has, you know, kind of changed it. Though they have transformed it, because, you know, uh, in the colonial time, they, we would have been talking about these previous generations, the first generation. But now, because the third generation are in picture, so third generation people, they might be aware of these cultural affiliation, they might feel connected to the Russian part or Soviet Union, but they are very much connected to the, these nationalizing states also, these uh, Baltic states. They feel more associated, their association is more towards the Baltic states. If you take the example of Latvia, Latvians, uh, Russians, they, these people, they are associating and um, associating more with Latvia than Russia. They might have family who's, you know, kind of uh, telling them about Russian culture and they might be following it in the private sphere. But if you see their uh, policies also, integration policies of these countries, they are trying to, you know, uh, kind of introduce them with, uh, uh, with very, uh, what do you call, with Latvian perspective also. They are being, you know, they, they, they are getting exposed to both sides. And somehow, when I was there in Latvia, I Riga especially, I kind of felt it also. It is something uh, which is not vanished, but it is uh, somehow transforming the society slowly. I hope I was able to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and then we have a question by... Uh, Professor Busman, as I can see. Yes, uh, thank you very much. That was a very interesting um, presentation. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. I was curious to hear a little bit more about the the, the stance of the the Russian speaking minorities. It was a little quick then, but did you feel like they have they are very similar in their outlook towards those territorial? Um, questions, or is it the different a big difference between the Latvian? I mean, the, the Russian-speaking minorities in Lat Latvia versus Estonia versus Lithuania. I just would be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you so much. And it is uh, actually, I I would have taken a long time to complete my presentation. But since PSR was like just concluded fast. So I feel there is little change. Like you see, territorially, if you see, Lithuania is a homogeneous country. They do not have much of, you know, difference people. Where I've stayed, I remember in that hotel, Russian speaking, speaking person was there, even Polish person was kind of working in that hotel. So they were, you know, it is like one aligning uh, happy country at least when it comes to the Russian part, Russian speaking population, though they have their issues with Polish minorities because they are in large number. 
and psychology if you see psychologically and emotionally they are uh, facing uh, crisis than russian speaking people so russian speaking people are more in numbers in latvia and uh, in, uh, their association with the russia and especially just now i just completed that it is about the generation the younger generation their association towards the latvia or estonia it is more than older generation and actually because of the language barrier i cannot say that how the older generation or the first generation people are feeling but because they are being you know kind of they do not have the citizenship right which comes with the language so these issues have kind of uh, given them this uh, feeling of insecurity and that is why they are not able to belong with these countries especially the first generation people second generation people and third generation people are fine because they are they can commute they can talk they can work and they are getting this proper white collar jobs also so somehow the russian minorities in uh, uh, latvia and especially the first generation people are having this loss of uh, kind of uh, belongingness but it is not the case with the third generation people and it it is similar between estonia and latvia when i interviewed few people uh, my sample survey was around 30 to 40 in latvia and i met 20 to 30 people in uh, estonia so they were like uh, they are happy because estonia and latvia is offering a good standard of life in comparison to the russian part so they are very much happy here their uh, cultural association is towards russia it's just that because you know in uh, human capacities it is not important it is not actually easy to snatch away the culture culture will be imbibed in human personality but if you see overall they are very much uh, happy living in these baltic states their uh, case is different than ukraine though uh, because of the ukrainian crisis the mistrust between government between the people especially the majority minority people it has been you know kind of introduced and they have been kind of uh, uh, given this skeptic eye what is there you know they might you know what if they say one day that we want to go to russia but that is not the case they do not want to just go and live there it is just the cultural association which is kind of binding them across borders I hope I was able to answer your question. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have time for, uh, as I see, actually, a last question or comment. If I could ask uh, 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 Dr. Nitu, please, to to make uh, it short, as short as possible, of course, uh, to our uh, panelists, uh, please. Cyprian uh, Nitu. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Akan. Akanksha for your presentation. Uh, yeah, as uh, as a uh, political scientist, I'm I'm interested to to pull the the past into the into the present, if I if I if I uh, may. And uh, I I'm I'm going to ask you if um, uh, or how do you evaluate the risks of interventionism? Of Russian interventionism today um, in uh, those provinces, in those regions that used to be former Soviet republics, where there is Russian-speaking population, a uh, part of it being in uh, in, uh, in effect exported population in the former Soviet uh, republics. Not only in the Baltic states, but also in Ukraine, in Republic of Moldova, in republics from Central Asia, in Caucasus. So, uh, is there, or was it visible uh, somehow in your interviews, the, this risk of Russian interventionism under the justification of protecting Russian citizens or Russian ethnics? Because some of these uh, ethnic Russians also have Russian citizenship. So uh, my question is not intended to be an offense for any participant, but I'm quite quite interested in the interested in the in the topic. So maybe. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you very much. Thank, thank you. It's always a, a difficult when you get closer to 
to our days in such subjects concerning emotions, as you put it right, uh, Cyprian, to both be interested and careful, of course. But we are here and we are looking at this, how we say, uh, sine ira et studio as uh, researchers. So I think uh, everybody is fine about it. But of okay. course, now uh, your Thank answer, you. please. Thank you. Thank you so much for an interesting question, actually. I came across uh, these Russians, if you are asking my personal experience, first let me just uh, start with that. So, as I told, uh, mostly because of uh, language issue, I could interview only to those people who could speak in uh, uh, English language. So, uh, I remember meeting one lady and uh, she was uh, not able to speak to me in English language. So, from her point of view, I remember I was with a translator and this person, this lady, she said she is... Uh, she was a businesswoman. She could travel to Russia and uh, Estonia back and forth without uh, much of hesitation. But her, uh, what do you call? It? Her perspective was also the same. It is like, why will I go to Russia or why will I go live in Russia if I'm getting a good livelihood, standard of living, and uh, everything is good in these countries, in the Baltic states, in Estonia, where I'm getting more paid my life is good here see basically she meant though uh, maybe politically she did not enjoy this uh, intervention by you know using this uh, whole uh, russian speaking population but it is something which she highlighted or she pointed out at the cultural association which is again uh, it might become you know kind of repetitive that culture is something where people feel very emotional about it is something which you cannot actually ignore or you cannot just take it away from a human personality. So uh, she had relatives in, living in Russia, St. Petersburg or Moscow. So she was like, I want to visit them. I want to have this uh, family connection. But when it comes to the borders or uh, interference of uh, Russian part, it kind of, it causes the threat. Uh, it causes this uh, mistrust uh, between me living here and the people who are my relatives who are there because it is somehow we come under this government eye the surveillance which is very kind of is strong and when you relate it with your political scientist uh, or political science stream we know that uh, interventionism is something which you know threatens this uh, whole scope of uh, nation state a state is formed with a defined territory in Westphalian Treaty, it has been mentioned. So another uh, country interfering in the domestic affairs of uh, an independent nation is not very well welcomed. It, it is something which you cannot actually do it. Russia being a regional hegemon has been trying it by using all these uh, extra methods, by using people, by using the pretext of uh, Russian speaking people, by using uh, the security alliances, which you are going to, you know, kind of uh, study in the next presentation. So all these, he, uh, Russia has been using and projecting uh, its power, but it is something which should not be there. Uh, an independent nation should not have intervention from the regional as well as the national hegemon. So I hope I have answered your question, sir. If you have uh, any doubt, you can ask me again. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so as, as I, I uh, said uh, yesterday, uh, if I can remember properly, uh, we will circulate between all the panelists uh, the emails. I will make a, a mailing list of uh, all of you, uh, and uh, it would be a, a good occasion if, after the conference, one or another of you wants to have contact and ask some more questions to do this by email. Thank you so much, uh, for this. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation and